This is an essay about the rules of thinking, and about the men who created those rules, and about the extraordinary figure who broke them into pieces. For centuries, since Aristotle's collected work, The Organon, on the rules of engagement governing argument and therefore logic, it has been, rather ironically, unquestionably accepted that any assertions which are put to the person rather than to the argument are fallacious, that is, illegitimate. And this idea has shaped thousands of years of thinking and thinking about thinking all the way down to the present day, all the way down to you. This species of would-be faulty reasoning is called the argumentum ad hominem. How does it apply? If we were engaged in a debate, and you propose that there is a God, because the world is obviously designed, and I reply, yes, but you are an animal, and therefore wrong, this would be deemed not only insulting, but also a logical fallacy, an ad hominem, because it goes to the characteristics of the person, and has nothing to do with the substance of the argument at hand. Friedrich Nietzsche says, think again. Now Aristotle's teacher was Plato, and Plato's teacher was Socrates, and Socrates Nietzsche held in the highest contempt, charging him with the very retardation of human potential throughout history. The year is 1888, the location Sils Maria, Switzerland, and in just over a week Friedrich Nietzsche has written his brilliant and groundbreaking Twilight of the Idols, the subtitle of which is How to Philosophize with the hammer. According to Ray Furness in his introduction, the hammer which Nietzsche uses is not a sledgehammer, but a geologist's tool used to sound out that which is solid and that which is hollow. The idols will be touched with the hammer as with a tuning fork. In this dynamite of a philosophical text is a chapter, The Problem of Socrates, in which Nietzsche begins with a diagnosis. In all ages, the wisest have always agreed in their judgment of life. It is no good. Even Socrates' last words were, to live means to be ill a long while. Bear in mind that this idea of life as illness, as illusion, as sin, as decay, is why Nietzsche held Socrates responsible for Christianity and its most essential and nihilistic principles. He goes on to state that, which in modern times would barely pass as anything like a valid argument, a statement which expresses a fact about Socrates which is very well known to scholarship, going all the way back to the earliest ancient Greek sources. He writes, you know, and you can still see it for yourself, how ugly he was. You were an ancient Athenian citizen. The first thing you've seen as a man was unbelievably ugly. His head was too big. His eyes were too large. His nose was all the wrong shape. Socrates' appearance breaks every rule of classical Greek aesthetics of the idea of proportion and measure. But ugliness, which is in itself an objection, was almost a refutation among the Greeks. But a man can be both ugly and correct at the same time, can't he? Hold that thought. As it was Aristotle who systemized logic and rationality through his work, it was Socrates who systemized the dialectical method, also known as the Socratic method. But Socrates was ugly. Nietzsche writes, With Socrates, Greek taste veers round in favor of dialectics. A man resorts to dialectics only when he has no other means at hand. To grasp Nietzsche's point, you must first understand that his study of past cultures, India, Greece, Rome, and beyond, led him to the realization that the noble masters of all cultures were characterized by the body, physicality, action, passion, pride, and force, pure will to power, while the oppressed sought to invert those high value systems with resentful and malignant intrigues, turning all that was good into so-called sin into a war against the very instincts which life itself overflows with. And the greatest practitioner of the art of this inversion through his bag of tricks of the dialectical method was Socrates. But Socrates was ugly. To declare that the ad hominem is an illegitimate form of argument 
is to sub-vocalize that human beings have no ulterior motives in their arguments, that people are truly objective, that they only want the truth for truth's sake, and are not in fact engaged in the fundamental pursuit of their own self-interests. To state that Socrates was aesthetically repulsive as a refutation in itself is to reintroduce history and psychology into the argument. It is to ask why one who was rabble, repressed, downtrodden and impotent would so fiercely wield this newly discovered weapon. It is a profoundly legitimate and rarely seen in philosophical circles honest and laudable question. Human. Humane. Technical ad hominem, as we understand it today, applies in the context of the argument at hand. But Nietzsche takes up not a solitary argument, but the entirety of philosophical inquiry itself, its history, and its development, indeed its very methods as employed throughout the ages, and lays a charge to the person at his feet. This person is Socrates. This person was oppressed and as a result, this person needed to forge a means to overcome. Is a Socratic irony an expression of revolt, of mob resentment, he states. As a creature suffering under oppression, does Socrates enjoy his innate ferocity in the knife thrusts of the syllogism? Does he wreak his revenge on the nobleman he fascinates? As a dialectician, a man has a merciless instrument to wield, he can play the tyrant with it. He compromises when he conquers with it. Can it be that dialectics was only a form of revenge in Socrates? Nietzsche recognized as a master psychologist that to try to divorce human psychology from any human endeavor, all of which involves self-interest, is at best delusional and at base simply another tool to increase one's power over others. For anyone to claim to have discovered a method a universal formula to truth, and especially if that truth so-called is hostile to life, declaring the world a realm of shadows, it should be looked on with suspicion, and tells us nothing of the complaint, but everything about the complainant, seeking to make defendants of us. After all, judgments and valuations of life, whether for or against, cannot be true. Their only value lies in the fact that they are symptoms. They can be considered only as symptoms, Per se, such judgments are nonsense. A living man cannot do so, because he is a contending party, or rather, the very object in the dispute, and not a judge. Nor can a dead man estimate it, for other reasons. And so, when Socrates describes life as illness or illusion, when Plato states in his theory of forms that there is a transcendent real world of which this world is but a poor imitation, when Buddhism and Hinduism describe nature itself as Maya, when Christianity says in Romans, be not conformed to this world, and speaks of those embedded in nature disdainfully as worldly, when Islam states that the life in the hereafter is the only true life, they all share this symptom in common, a symptom which Nietzsche saw in those who were fundamentally, even a priori, enemies of the world, and that is contempt of life itself. The idea that the world is not real could only be held by those who were at base decadent and move against all life-affirming instincts. Did he understand himself, this most intelligent of self-deceivers? Did he confess to himself, in the end, in the wisdom of his courage before death? Socrates wished to die. Not Athens, but his own hand gave him the draught of hemlock. He drove Athens to the poisoned cup. Socrates is not a doctor, he whispered to himself. Death alone can be a doctor here. Socrates himself was only ill a long while.